And I think that's a serious problem. Bob, um, could, if, I, if I could ask you just one very brief question, or a question that probably only needs a very brief answer. Um, you have inspired generations of lawyers with your opening remarks about the need to enforce international humanitarian law, international rule of law, and I think that that inspiration is going to lead to some people investigating war crimes and uh, human rights violations by top American officials. I think that must be on the mind of the current administration. Are you aware with all of your ties within the Beltway of pardons being discussed who might be pardoned. Um, President Bush, ironically, I understand, can't pardon himself, but I have uh, heard and I uh, value your information on whether pardons are being discussed and if those are likely to be secret pardons. You, you may remember. Pre preemptive pardons. Yeah, there, there's never been a short answer, but I'll try to keep it to a minute. Okay. Uh, there, there, the, you may remember the op ed I did in July of last year entitled War Crimes in the White House. Well, let's just say I haven't received any invitations from the White House since then, and I have no scuttlebutt on that. It's something I've thought about. It's something I have real mixed feelings on because, one, every time we break the law, we undermine the rule of law around the world. We undermine our moral authority. Uh, at the same time, at the lower level, I'm just not persuaded, I may be wrong, but I'm not persuaded that it's justice when a young, inexperienced, non-legal trained interrogator is told the Attorney General of the United States that says this is legal and then does it uh, to, to then see him published. Now again, if we were talking about cutting off fingers or something like that, things that just absolutely clearly, even in wartime, are impermissible, I'd feel different about it. But I, this is, I really believe, what we call, what John Moore calls torture light. It's a violation of the law, uh, but the question, the part of me says, well, the heck with the interrogator you know, he can't have justice, so the world will perceive us as a country that believes in the rule of law. Uh, and I recognize that thing, but, but part of me says, hey, this guy volunteered, went into harm's way, did what we told him to do in a setting where I think a lot of young soldiers would not understand that even waterboarding in wartime, you know, was against the rules. I'm just not sure justice is done by punishing them. As far as going after the top people, there's a much stronger case for that. If the president, one thing I was looking at, if the president, right now, the Military Commissions Act could be repealed like that, and everybody who, who engaged in misconduct could be tried. There would be no ex post facto, you know, I don't think there's any question about that. The one thing that would protect them would be if the president issued a pardon, because a pardon is an absolute power, it is unreviewable by anyone. There's one exception to the pardon power. Anybody remember what it is? We don't have time, but it's, uh, you can't pardon someone who's been impeached. Other than that, it's an absolute exclusive executive power, uh, and that would protect them, and I believe it would also protect them from extradition. Uh, I don't think that issue has ever been considered, but I would think that uh, the act of extradition, you know, would be precluded by, by a pardon. I, you know, I don't know, I don't even know if it's a good idea, but I, I can't imagine it's not being considered. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure it is being considered, and I think that the idea of having secret pardons is so that uh, courts abroad may think we're pursuing some kind of investigation. There's not a known pardon that would send the signal that we're not doing anything. So that's been one of the concerns that's been raised. But on, if I could, uh, we'll, we'll have time for yeah. more comments when the, okay. when the uh, audience comes. But I, I have a, another brief question for Philippe. President Bush cannot pardon himself. There, there is a lot of confusion um, after the arrest warrant case about a head of state and how extensive his immunity may be under international law. Of course, the United States did not recognize Manuel Noriega's head of state immunity when we put him in prison for drug dealing, but is it your sense that uh, President Bush would uh, have any claim to head of state immunity after he's out of office? He's entitled under international law to absolute immunity so long as he is head of state. Once he ceases to be head of state, the situation turns, uh, as it does for any uh, senior government uh, officer, uh, in relation to what the alleged crime is. Uh, you'll recall that in the Pinochet case, uh, in the House of Lords, uh, in, in which I was one of numerous counsel, the loss of immunity arose as a result of the coming into force of the Convention Against Torture, which was interpreted unanimously, well, I think six votes to one, uh, as being inconsistent. The convention 
and the obligation to prosecute or extradite was inconsistent uh, with a rule of immunity. The Convention, as you know, itself is silent uh, on the question of immunity. Now, that's significant uh, because it would mean that as a matter of the Torture Convention, uh, the loss of immunity, immunity is not waived in relation to prior acts, uh, in relation to cruel and human degrading treatment, uh, and it's far from clear that the loss of immunity would arise under the Geneva Conventions, whereas there is not an equivalent obligation to prosecute or extradite. And finally, for the purposes of completeness, um, under customary international law, the law lords ruled in the House of Lords case that there was no waiver or loss of immunity by operation of customary international law. You had to be a party to a treaty which explicitly or implicitly did away with your entitlement to immunity. So the loss of immunity around the world is likely to be rather narrow uh, in relation to the allegations of crime. Uh, and finally, I think it's worth just adding in relation to the International Criminal Court, uh, there is one country, very oddly, which is a party to the statute of the ICC, uh, and that's Afghanistan. Uh, and in relation to acts which occurred in Afghanistan, irrespective of the nationality of the actor, so it would include an American national, the ICC does indeed have jurisdiction uh, after the date of entry into force for that state. And, and in the ICC there is no immunity. And I did want to ask Noah about the ICC. He wanted to comment, I think, on the immunity question, but also Noah is very close to the uh, top officials of the ICC, and we'd like to know what they're talking about in the corridors. Okay, I'm sorry. I misled you about the Afghanistan thing. That's true. Afghanistan is a party to the ICC, so there is a jurisdiction over Afghanistan. But on the immunity issue, uh, I, I need to make the point that the Rome system admits um, uh, no immunity for heads of state uh, who have committed those three crimes. So you can see that there's a request by the prosecutor for an arrest warrant for the head of state of Sudan. And this is the first time that this has been done in, in history. Uh, and this shows that the system is moving along. A, an untried system, we don't know where it's going to go, but the immunities are eroding. Uh, if there's talks in the corridors of the International Criminal Court about uh, prosecuting uh, um, uh, American officials, the prosecutor put out a statement uh, after receiving a tremendous amount of information about alleged crimes being committed in Iraq. This was a public statement, you could find it on the internet, which says he has no jurisdiction uh, over Iraq, and he uh, enumerates the reasons why. Um, it's, it's a nuanced statement, uh, and, and you can see, you can get a general idea of the tack uh, that this prosecutor is going to take in relation to allegations uh, against American top political and military officials. We don't know what a future prosecutor might do. However, no prosecutor in history that I know of has been under so many constraints as the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. There are so many checks and balances against this man because states were so fearful uh, of giving him the powers that they did um, uh, that I imagine that um, we don't have anything to fear from a rogue prosecutor. Uh, those were some of the arguments that I've heard uh, Ambassador Prosper make uh, in different contexts. I would have liked to talk to him about that. Uh, I think that those are trumped up uh, fears. Great. Thank you very much, Noah.